Thank you, Miles. Well, good evening, everyone. It's lovely to be able to come together and to worship God together, and we're looking forward to the ministry of His Word this evening. Uh, we're going to start off tonight with our uh, consecutive readings in Proverbs. And so if you have your Bible with you, turn with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 24. And we'll finish this chapter off tonight. Proverbs chapter 24. And starting to read at verse 23. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse, nations will abhor him. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight and a good blessing will come upon them. He who gives a right answer kisses the lips. Prepare your outside work, make it fit for yourselves in the field, and afterwards build your house. Do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause, for would you deceive with your lips? Do not say, I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. I went by the field of the lazy man, and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler, and your need like an armed man. Amen. Uh, may God bless those words of wisdom to us this evening. Let's just commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we want to thank you for our gathering together tonight. We praise you for the opportunity in which we have to to gather, to, to worship you, and to praise you. Father, your word constantly reminds us that you are worthy of that praise. And Father, when we think of the many blessings that you've given to us in our lives, when we look at a week that has gone past, and Lord, we see how every good and perfect gift has come from your hand, Lord, the health and strength that you've given to us has come from you, knowing that you are the one that holds our, our very breath of our lives in your hand, and you give it and take it as you will. Father, we thank you not only for all of the blessings, these material things and life that you've given to us, but Father, we thank you most of all for who you are tonight, that you are indeed the, the God of heaven. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Father, you have made it possible that we as sinful people can know what it is to have a relationship with yourself. We can know what it is to come and to cry on to you, Abba, Father. And so, our Father, we want to thank you afresh for Jesus. Because, Father, we know that without him we would be lost and without hope in this world. Without him, there would be this great gulf fixed between you and us. But Father, thank you this evening that Jesus has bridged that gulf. That Jesus had made it possible through his death and through his sacrifice on Calvary that we can come and that we can pray to you tonight knowing that we have a God in heaven who hears us. And Father, we pray that as we continue throughout the rest of this service, Lord, thanking you that you know us tonight. There's not an area in our lives, there's not a thing about us that you do not know. And Father, to that end, we pray that you might minister to us. We pray that you might speak to us. We, we pray, Father, that 
through your word and, and through your servant as he comes shortly to, to, to speak through your word. We pray that, Lord, that we might be ready and receptive to hear what you might say. Thank you tonight that you're a God who loves us. Thank you that you're a God tonight who cares for us. And Father, we pray that we might be ready to receive your instruction and your exhortation this evening. And Father, as we think of this lovely topic about uh, the coming or the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray that you might stir our hearts. Father, to realize that we may not even get to lay our heads upon our pillows tonight because Jesus may return at any moment. And so, our Father, we pray that you would undertake for Pastor Clifford as he opens your word, as he speaks this evening, Lord, that you might speak through him. Lord, pray that you might help him as he ministers your word tonight. And Lord, we pray that you might help us as we listen to it. And so, our Father, we pray, help us to gather our thoughts this evening. Help us not to be distracted by things that occupy our time throughout each day of this week. But Lord, we pray that you'd help us to focus on you, to focus on your Son, and to focus on your Word. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand together as we sing another hymn of praise filled with compassion for all creation. Thank you. And bring us God's word for this evening. But just before he does that, Anne is going to come and read it. Thank you very much, Anne. This reading is from First Thessalonians, first chapter four, verse thirteen to eighteen. Mm -hmm. 
But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. God. Well, it's good to be with you this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to come and to preach at one of my favorite pulpits. It's good to return home and to be with you in car. And I know that you have been remembering us in prayer in the Shankill Church. We have been looking to the Lord. We have been enjoying His presence and His blessing today. So the recommencement of our afternoon Sunday school, and we get about an average of 20 children to the Sunday school. There's not a, a family connected with those children who come to church or have any Christian uh, interest whatsoever. So it's a great gospel opportunity. Our youth meet on a Friday night, the first and the third, and about 20 young people uh, meeting there. Uh, tonight, David Dixon from the Shankill Community Fellowship uh, is preaching in Shankill, and we're enjoying fellowship with David and enjoying uh, his ministry in these days. Next uh, Sunday evening sees the commencement of four special nights entitled This is the Life. And special guests are coming along. It will be in a very in informal evening. We're uh, meeting in our church hall around tables and uh, I will be interviewing different people. Next uh, Sunday night I will be interviewing David Patterson and then on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, I'll be interviewing different folk each night, and uh, we will be serving tea and coffee and refreshments and hoping in that informal atmosphere to reach non-church people, people who are not in the habit of going to church. Every Tuesday afternoon, there's a group of men to go out into the community uh, to try to speak to people about the Lord. I see Sharon here tonight, and she knows what I'm saying to be absolutely true. We're in a pagan, barren, heathen situation. People have no background, no understanding of even John 3 and verse 16. But it's to those people that we go and bring the glorious riches of the grace of God. I can assure you that we pray for you every morning and every evening in our home and uh, Whilst I'm not here, Margaret is here from time to time, and she gives a good report of the work in car. So thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your fellowship in the gospel from the very first day until now. Let's pause to pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this evening for your word. We thank you for the gracious ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we pray that as we turn to your word this evening, we might know the help of the third person of the Trinity, the Spirit of the living God. Speak, Lord, in the quietness of these moments as we think of this great message this evening, what we should know about the second coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for Christ our Savior's sake. Amen. Because of its rough seas, and difficult weather conditions, the southern edge of Africa was once referred to as the Cape of Tempest. In fact, many sailors lost their lives in the turbulent waters. But a Portuguese captain, convinced that there was a safer course of travel, discovered a special route around the Cape. And now, interestingly enough, the area is known as the Cape of Good Hope. The Cape of Good hope. As the Christian, 
makes his our way through the rough waters of this world, en route to the heavenly shore, they do not have to live in utter despair or hopelessness. There is a root of comfort, there is a root of consolation, and that comfort and consolation is found in no one else other than the Lord Jesus Christ, in who he is, in what he's done, in where he is now, and in how he feels about his people, and in his settled purpose for the future. We might say this evening that the Lord Jesus is our cape of good hope. Writing in Titus 2 and verse 13 and 14, we read these words, we wait for the blessed hope. What is that blessed hope? It's the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his own, eager to do what is good. The pagan world in Paul's day had no sense of hope. There was nothing in their heart and soul to cheer the tomb or give them strength for the future. A typical inscription on many a gravestone demonstrated this fact. The four statements read as follows, I was not, I became, I am not, and I care not. The pagan world had no hope. It was a dark, dismal, dreadful world. Someone has said that the pagans may change their clothes, but not their world. But not so the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Not so for the one who not only believes in Christ, but belongs to Christ through saving grace. We have a blessed hope. And that blessed hope is found in none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to speak to you this evening simply on what you need to know about the second coming of the Lord Jesus. Not what you would like to know. I leave that to the scholars to do that. And I know there have been much speculation and many outlandish statements have been made regarding the second coming. And all sorts of calculations have been made in turning people's names into 666 and all the rest of it. And a lot of things are being said today about the vaccine and what that's the sign off and all the rest of it. Well, I'm going to leave that aside and Junior can sort that out for you in uh, coming days. I want to talk to you tonight simply about what you need to know about the coming again of the Lord Jesus. We read these words this evening, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, therefore, in the light of this, because of this, comfort each other with these words. I want you to think with me tonight about three things. I want you to think with me tonight about the authority of God's Word. I want you to think with me tonight about the activity of God's Son. And I want you to think with me this evening about the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a blessed hope this evening because of the authority of God's Word. Because of the authority of God's Word. Some may ask, how can mortal man penetrate beyond the grave and find assurance and peace for his own heart? I think it's true to say that from the Old Testament days till the present time, man has tried to solve the riddle of death and the afterlife. Philosophers have wrestled with the question of immortality. Spiritists have tried to communicate with those who have gone beyond. In our modern world, scientists have investigated the experience of people who claim to have died and returned to life again. They've also studied the occult, hoping to find a clue to the mystery of life after death. Paul solved the problem when he wrote those words that we have read earlier this evening. Notice what we read in 1 Thessalonians 4. According to his Word. That's what we read in verse 
15 of 1 Thessalonians 4. According to the Lord's own word. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. One translation puts it like this. We tell you this directly from the Lord. And we who are the Lord's tonight, we who are saved by sovereign grace, we who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit need not worry about death or the afterlife for we have a revelation from God in his word. God is not silent on these things. Why should we put the word of man, which is vain speculation, before the word of God, which is divine revelation? The Bible tells us that not all Christians will die. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. There will be an innumerable company of believers who will enter glory not by the grave, but as a result of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read of how God gave Paul a special revelation concerning the resurrection and the return of Christ to the air for his own. Behold, I show you a mystery. And of course, if I was speaking to boys and girls and saying, now, I'm going to use a word. I want you to write down the next word that comes into your mind when I use this word. And the word that I would mention in their hearing would be the word mystery. And immediately they would think of darkness. Immediately they would think of something spooky. But of course, that's not the meaning of the word in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. The word mystery there means a truth which up until that moment had not been revealed. You see, the average believer believed that you entered into the presence of God, you entered into God's eternal heaven by the grave. Now that's the way you entered into glory at the end of your earthly journey. But here Paul is bringing to them something which they had never considered before, something which they had never realized before, that there was going to be an innumerable company of believers who would enter into glory, not by the grave, but as a result of the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's coming a day, according to Holy Scripture, when the trumpet will sound and the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first and we who are alive and remain shall be caught up and together we shall meet the Lord in the air. The sounding of the trumpet. The trumpet here, of course, would bring many thoughts to the mind of the readers. There are many trumpets mentioned in Scripture. There are trumpets in the Old Testament at the beginning of each month, the Feast of Trumpets. When the nation of Israel marched, there were trumpets sounded. And the trumpet in Scripture seemed to be a sign of assembling, a sign of going forward, a sign of taking a new step, the unfolding of something that had not been revealed before. The trumpet here in 1 Thessalonians 4 is like the sounding of the trumpet to an army. It's a call to march forward. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we have the shout, the loud command, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God. These are three separate things, but they picture one grand event the coming of Christ for his church. And when I talk about the church, I'm not talking about the building. Of course, you would know that. I'm talking about the redeemed of the Lord. I'm talking about the aggregate of God's people from every nation, from every kindred, from every tribe, from every tongue. The blood-bought, redeemed church of God. These separate things are pictured as one grand event, the coming of Christ for his church and the translation of the church, the living and the dead from scenes of earth to the scenes of heaven. 
The word translated means to be caught up, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Paul tells us that it will happen in a moment, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye. Someone has said that the average person blinks somewhere between 10,000 to 20,000 times a day. Paul is telling us here, in one of those moments, Jesus could return. That's an awesome thought. I hope you were listening to Junior's prayer this evening. And I hope you caught what he was saying when he intimated that there is a possibility, a glorious possibility, that before our hands touch the pillow this evening, the trumpet will sound. And this event that is alluded to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 will have taken place. In the twinkling of an eye, Jesus is going to step from his throne at the right hand of the Father in heaven and come to the air. A word that is sometimes used to describe this event is the word the rapture. And it simply means a snatching away. It's the same word that is used in the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch recorded in Acts chapter 8 and verse 39, where we read that the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away or carried Philip away. The same word is used by Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 when he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. One of these days, the church, the redeemed of Christ, all who are the Lord's, those who have trusted in Christ alone for salvation, those who are depending on what Christ did through his death on the cross for their salvation, they will be removed. They will be caught up. They will be caught away. They will be raptured. They will be translated to meet the Lord in the air. This event has been likened to a, met, a metal scrapyard. Well, you may ask, what does a, a scrapyard in this event I have been referring to have in common? Well, in the scrapyard, there was a great magnet on the crane that would pick up the metal. And if you swung the magnet across the ground, not every piece of metal would rise, only that which was made of iron. Why is that? Well, the answer is that the iron has the same nature as the magnet. And in the same way, if you have the same nature of Jesus Christ, then when he comes to the air, to the sky, to the clouds, you are going up. There's an old hymn that says, there's going to be a meeting in the air. Whether you're beneath the ground or on top of the ground, if you have been born again of the Holy Spirit, you will be heaven bound at that moment of time. This is the hope of every saved soul and only the saved soul. We have a blessed hope this evening because of the authority of God's Word. According to the Lord's own Word, says Paul, we tell you. We have a blessed hope, secondly, because of the activity of God's Son. Because of the activity of God's Son. Paul says here, brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant concerning those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. One of the greatest facts of the Christian faith is that we have hope when our loved ones in Christ are taken from us in death. The world cannot comprehend the hopelessness that characterizes world's religion. There is no hope in the future life apart from Jesus Christ. And the Christian, the child of God, the saved, has this wonderful hope that after this life there's going to be a glorious, unending existence in the presence of God with a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. And that cannot be appreciated in this world because the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not, 
lest the glorious light of the gospel should shine in. When we are joined with Christ and our loved ones in Christ, we will meet in that eternal resting place. And so Paul tells these Thessalonians that he doesn't want them to have the attitude of the pagan world, which has no hope. But instead, he wants them to enter experimentally into the glory of that hope that is before them in Jesus Christ. And verse 14 of 1 Thessalonians 4 is the basis of that blessed hope. I'm calling it the activity of the Savior. We have been told by Paul that this blessed hope is built on the sure word of God according to the Lord's own word. Now he goes on to tell us that this sure hope is not only based on the word of the Lord, it's also based on the work of the Lord. Not only based on the sure word of the Lord, but based on the saving work of the Lord. We read in verse 14, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. In other words, the precious truth of the second coming of Christ for his own is as certain as the central and cardinal truths of the death and the resurrection of the Savior. Unless we are absolutely certain about the death and resurrection of Christ, we will not be certain about the blessed hope. You cannot understand the coming again of the Lord Jesus without believing in his crucifixion. You see, the place to begin is at the cross of Christ. It's there that Jesus died for our sins. It's there that we learn that we have a substitute, one who was able to save us and one who is able to provide a suitable and satisfying sufficient sacrifice for all our sins. And we will never get anywhere with God until we first come and meet with him at the place called Calvary. The old chorus puts it so well, there is a way back to God. From the dark paths of sin, a door has been opened and we may go in at Calvary's cross is where we begin when we come as sinners to Jesus. And I wonder tonight, have you been to the cross? Have you recognized your need of a Savior? And if you bowed beneath the shadow of the cross and by faith looked to the Christ of the cross who bore your sin in his body upon the tree. Linked with the cross, of course, is the resurrection. Christ sealed his sufficient work by being raised from the dead. The evidence of the acceptance of Christ's once and for all sacrifice was indicated by God the Father when he raised him from the dead. Here is the stamp of certainty. Christ rose from the dead. If we believe that Christ died for us, if we believe that Christ really rose from the dead and are trusting in him and in him alone, then we have a blessed hope. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming. Oh, glorious day. We have a blessed hope because of the authority of God's Word. We have a blessed hope because of the activity of God's Son. And we have a blessed hope because of the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, the second coming of Christ gives the believing and the trusting heart stability and comfort. The second coming of Christ gives the believing and trusting heart serenity and hope. I believe that the drama of the ages is about to be completed. The curtain is about to rise, and Jesus will rise from his throne high on from his throne on high and step out into the heavens. The first act was his incarnation. 
as a baby born of a virgin named Mary. He took off his royal robes and put on swaddling clothes. The second act was his death, burial, and resurrection. He died in agony to pay our sin debt with his red royal blood. And now we look for that final act, his coming to claim his own and take them out of this world that is doomed for eternal judgment. There will be a rescue before God pours out his wrath upon this godless world. And all who have rejected his son, he's going to take out his church. Before God declares war on this world, he's going to take his nationals home. There will be a rescue. There will be a rapture. There will be a reunion, all believers in Christ, the church, the redeemed of the Lord. Together we will meet the Lord in the air and we will sing and shout and praise the Lamb for sinners slain. What a grand homecoming will take place through the meeting in the air. There will be a rapture, a rescue. There will be a reunion. There will be a reception. Jesus is coming to receive us. I will come again and take you to be with myself that where I am, there you will be also. Do you remember what the angel said to those disciples recorded in Acts chapter 1? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. How did Jesus go? He went personally. Therefore, he will return personally. He went bodily, therefore he will return bodily. He went suddenly, therefore he will return suddenly. He went visibly, therefore he will return visibly. Jesus will come again, and he's coming soon. And that is our blessed hope, the hope of the church of Jesus Christ, the hope of all who belong to the Lord himself through saving faith. You see, when we think of the second coming, there are three things to keep in mind. First of all, the Bible declares it. We've already alluded to that this evening. There are 70 references to the word repentance in the New Testament. There are 20 references to baptism. There are six references to the Lord's Supper. There are 318 references to the second coming of the Lord Jesus. The Bible declares it. Secondly, history demands it. Some people say history is full of confusion. It's heading for chaos. It's going round in circles. It's heading for a climax. Because history, as someone has said, is his story. The Bible declares it. History demands it. And the Christian's experience confirms it. Paul writes about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he reminds his readers that if Christ be not risen from the dead, then our faith is futile. Our preaching is a waste of time. But here's what he says in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians 15. But now Christ has become the first fruits of them that sleep. It's a farming term. And had you lived in Paul's day, you would have known what he meant by the first fruits. It was going back to the harvest. And the first sheaves of the harvest were brought in and waved by the high priest before God. And that was an indication that the rest of the harvest was going to be gathered in. Christ is our first fruits. And because he has been raised from the dead, there is no doubt, there is no doubt whatsoever that the dead in Christ will rise first. We sing blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Listen to these words. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. You see, salvation in the Word of God has a threefold dimension to it. I remember when I was a young Christian, if someone had said to me, tell me, what do you understand about salvation? Well, I would have said, I can tell you, the night I got saved, I trusted in Christ for salvation. I realized I was a sinner, and I asked Jesus to forgive me and to pardon me for my sin, and to make me a child of God. And salvation means that. The word that is used is justification. 
therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. But salvation is more than that. You heard the story of the Salvation Army girl who was giving out the war cry one afternoon in the marketplace. And she saw this man coming along, and he seemed to be a church man. And she handed him the magazine, and she said to him, Sir, are you saved? Then he took a step back, and he said, Now, dear, what do you mean? Do you mean, am I saved? Am I being saved? Or shall I be saved? And she looked at him. And the fact of the matter was this. He was giving to her a threefold dimension of the meaning of the word salvation. You see, as Christians, we're being saved. The word that the Bible uses is the word sanctification. Every day, as we yield to the Holy Spirit, we are being made more and more like our blessed Savior, the Lord Jesus. But one day, we shall be saved. And the word that is used there is the word glorification. Listen to what Paul says. He says, the hour has come for you to wake up from sleep. For our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. What's he talking about? He's talking about the completeness of our salvation. The day when we shall meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Robert Murray McShane, that godly Presbyterian minister, used to ask people, do you think that Jesus will return today? And many would say, well, I don't think today. And then McShane would respond, then my friend, you'd better get ready for his coming at such an hour as you think not. You also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you think not. It was a cold November morning. I was living in Portadown. We were living in Portadown, and I had an appointment in the hospital, and Margaret was taking me in the car, and I was getting ready, and she was down in the working kitchen doing her usual duty as a faithful wife, making her husband her breakfast. If you believe that, you'll believe anything. But anyway, she shouted up the stairs, where's your car? I said, pardon? She says, where's your car? I says, what do you mean, where's your car? She says, it's not here. I says, don't be at it. She says, I'm telling you, it's not here. So I think I went down the stairs. I think it took me six stairs at a time. I went outside. I said, my car's not here. I says, maybe I've been parked outside. I went outside, walked up and down town. Yeah, but I, my car's not here. And it's suddenly dawn. Someone has come and taken my car and hasn't asked me for permission. So the police were called on the job. And I didn't really know what I was saying. I was in shock. And Margaret says, all that I kept saying to the police was, it's immaculate. It's absolutely immaculate. <laughs> There's not a mark on it. Inside and outside, it's immaculate. It's absolutely immaculate. <laughs> and when they got me settled down, I gave them a description of the car. And they still said it was immaculate. But I never forgot that experience. I never thought it could have happened to me. I read of it happening to others. I heard of it happening to others. But I never heard that it would happen to me. The Bible tells us, tells us that he will come as a thief in the night. That doesn't mean that the Lord Jesus is a thief. What it means is this. He will come in that unexpected moment. C.A. Blackmore was one of America's pioneer radio preachers. And on one occasion, he was preaching on the second coming of Christ. In the course of his message, he said, My friend, we have a glorious hope. The Bible calls it the blessed hope for the Christian. The Bible tells us that one day the trumpet will sound and Jesus himself will come back to take his children home. Dear brother or sister in Christ, all your pain and suffering will be over. You'll have a new body, new arms, new legs. You'll be like Jesus in a glorified body, fitted for the eternal home someday, some golden daybreak when Jesus will come. A few days later, Mr. Blackmore received a letter from a woman listener who had been bedridden for years. 
She wrote as follows, Mr. Blackmore, the message you gave on Jesus coming again was such a blessing to me. I've been an invalid for almost 25 years and sometimes I get so discouraged. I can hardly wait for the Lord to come again. To think I'll be able to walk again and there'll be no heartaches there. There'll be no pain, there'll be no sorrow, there'll be no parting. Thank you very much for your sermon. Mr. Blackmore's son, Carl, was the pianist and solos for the broadcast. He too had been moved by the sermon his father had preached. A few days later, he sat down and wrote these words. Some glorious morning, sorrows will cease. Some glorious morning, all will be peace. Heartaches all ended, labor all done. Heaven will open, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, Jesus will come. Some golden daybreak, battles all won. He'll shout the victory. Break through the gloom. Some golden daybreak for me, for you. Will it? Will it? Let me emphasize this evening that I've tried to share with you tonight all that you need to know about the second coming that Jesus will come again, that it will happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. He will come as a thief in the night. And that's why I urge you this evening to trust Christ, to know within your own soul this blessed hope, a blessed hope that you can have because of the authority of God's Word, a blessed hope that you can have because of the activity of God's Son and a blessed hope that you can have because of the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. You will never be able to stand in the presence of God and say, yeah, you know, God, no one told me about your second coming in your Son. No one told me that it would happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. If you try to say that, God will remind you that on the 19th of September in Carr Baptist Church, you heard a preacher, he wasn't a great preacher, but you heard him tell you that my son was coming again in an unexpected moment, in an hour when you think not. And he told you also the need to be ready, lest that day come and find you wanting. Let's pray. Father, in the quietness and in the stillness of these moments, write your word upon all our hearts this evening. And as your redeemed children, help us, O oh God, to live in the light of your coming. Help us to spend and be spent for the kingdom of God. And should there be any here tonight, young or old, who have never trusted Christ, maybe some are not sure whether they're saved or not, help them not to leave this house tonight without knowing that all their sins are forgiven. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life because they are trusting in Christ and His finished work on the cross for their salvation. We pray this in our Savior's name. Amen. Let's conclude the meeting by singing when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. Let's stand while we sing. Thank you.
68. We just had completed and graduated from the Bible College in South Wales. And we were standing on the lawn in the first uh, of the main building of the college campus. Some from Vietnam, uh, some from Germany, some from different parts of Europe. And we sang that song. I haven't seen most of them from that day. And we sang the chorus like this, when the road is called up yonder, we'll be lost in love and wonder, some from every tribe and nation will be there. We wonder tonight, will you be there? Father, write your word on all our hearts. Part us in your fear and with your favor. And may grace, mercy, and peace from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon us and upon all whom we love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.